Life as we know is unpredictable. We know life is very unpredictable. We know today life is unpredictable. And as a physician and a doctor who does pulmonary and critical care, I'm the kind of doctor you don't want to see. You have to be really sick to come see me. What I do is I take care of patients who have very severe illnesses, and I'm actually helping them get back to life. A lot of times in critical illness, their vital signs are abnormal, their heart rate is low or fast, their blood pressure is low or extremely high, and people are really dying. And in this kind of a setting, if you can provide critical care, which is really providing support, vital support to patients at the critical phase of their life, you can make a difference. When you can provide critical care, you really need a hospital, you need a machine, you need high-tech monitors, but the truth is, that isn't the truth. You really need expertise to be shared. And today I'm going to share with you an overview of what that can be. Because you can actually provide intensive care everywhere to anybody, anytime. Let's take the case of Mrs. Pushpa. She's about 50 years old. She has had about chest pain for the last 30 minutes. She's been quite short of breath, has not been able to catch her breath. She's had difficulty in walking. And then she complains to her people nearby saying, I'm not able to breathe, what can I do? They immediately rush her to the nearest hospital. She has a low blood pressure. And then they realize that you know, she needs to be treated for possibly a heart attack. Now the question that the doctor at that location faces is, can we actually keep the patient here? Should we move the patient? What can we do? And that depends on the expertise of the hospital, the doctor, and how sick the patient is. That could be in New York City, Pushpa might be there. She might be in Jubilee Hills, or she might be on the outer ring road, going in a car, 100 kilometers from the nearest hospital. What can we do in that setting? When you're facing a situation like that, you come across critical care. Unfortunately, not just in India, but around the world, the cost of critical care is unreasonable. The average cost is about 17,000 rupees on average it shoots up all the way up to the several lakhs to the crores if somebody is extremely ill. Now this is the reality that Pushpa might have to face depending on where she is from, who she is, and which hospital she is in, and also depends on how sick she is. About 40% of people actually end up in poverty after one episode of illness where they have to borrow money and they have to actually change their complete lifestyle, sell lands, etc. There's a huge gap, huge gap between the number of patients and the number of beds. There's only about 70,000 critical care beds in India for 5 million patients. That's a gigantic gap. We clearly have lots of patients, extremely sick patients, not enough facilities to actually take care of them in a comprehensive way. In that kind of an atmosphere, this is our biggest public enemy. It's not nuclear weapons, it's not missiles, it's not North Korea. The humble mosquito kills more people than we can think of, and we have not yet conquered this. In this kind of a setting, especially in a tropical country like ours, you have to figure out, how can I provide critical care for everybody, all the time, everywhere? With these kinds of almost insurmountable challenges, what can actually be done? Now, anybody guess what planet that is? It's not Neptune, it is Earth. Sometimes you have to look at your own planet a little differently. We're not all water, obviously. There's a lot of land on our planet. But sometimes you have to look at life differently. So what we decided to do was, can we approach this problem of extreme cost, extremely sick patient, lots of patients, how can we look at it differently and figure out, can we solve the problem? During this thought process, we, I came across a group uh, overseas who are actually providing intensive care to patients in the United States located from abroad. They were actually remotely monitoring patients in intensive care units around the United States, and that concept was something that I was very attracted to. I contacted them, and in fact, over about a period of a year or so, started monitoring patients from India for the United States. I've been doing that for about seven years now, and during this process, thought struck me, when I can sit here in Hyderabad and watch patients 8,000 miles away, why can't I do it for India? 
With this thought in mind, I approached the people who run our hospital system and several other groups, and we said, let's do this for India. And we decided to begin a similar process where we actually watch patients remotely around India and other countries too, where you can actually provide critical care. Now, in critical illness, if you look at that slide there, between health and critical illness, there's a transition. You have to look at the group, like somebody who's sick, you need to have someone, first of all, diagnose that they're sick. So you need an expert. But the expert needs some evidence and some information, data, to conclude that this patient is sick. And on top of all that, you're going to need to communicate between the patient, the family, the health system, the labs, et cetera, to come up with a comprehensive plan on how to actually take care of this patient. Now, the critical part of healthcare is the knowledge. It is not the technology. The knowledge is what really makes a difference between somebody who can take care of a patient and who cannot take care of a patient. Technology is critical, but it is not the most critical part of taking care of a patient. We have safety in the air, why not on the ground? Several of you have flown in airplanes in the recent past. You didn't know the pilot. The pilot didn't know you. The air traffic controller controlling the aircraft had no clue who the pilot was. But you took off safely and you landed safely. Why can't we do that in healthcare? In fact, we should be doing something even more aggressive in healthcare because lives are at stake. If we can replicate what the aviation industry can do in terms of safety, we will be able to achieve significant advances in taking care of especially critically ill patients. The centerpiece over there is Narada. I call him the ideal god of communication. He's obviously, mythology says he's talking among the worlds, communicating between different people. Healthcare is like that. If you want to be a good healthcare provider, communication is key. There is extremely good data to show that if you communicate well, you have less errors, you actually improve the outcomes, there are less people dying, you can actually lower the cost and definitely improve healthcare. So I think Narada is a good example of how to really be an effective healthcare provider. And tele-ICU, which is a concept I'm talking about, is remotely providing intensive care to patients wherever they may be using technology. Now, that's Dr. Scribble, now obviously, this is stereotypical of my handwriting, but I call this the cliff theory. I don't know if you make out, but let's see here. Right, the black stuff is the cliff. At the left bottom is a patient in a bed. He fell off the cliff. Healthcare is like that. Patients are falling off the cliff. Illness is pushing them off the cliff. And the healthcare team's role is to pull them back up onto the top of the cliff and as far away from the edge as possible. Now that's an expensive proposition. If you have a patient with several illnesses, it's going to be hard to keep pulling. But several patients are so sick that they keep falling down. Sometimes it's not their fault, sometimes it's their fault. A smoker, someone who drinks a lot, someone who doesn't take their diabetic medications, they will keep falling off the cliff. Now one of the big reasons for healthcare costs is the cliff. And what I would propose is that you can actually guide people back up to climb up and get back onto a healthy atmosphere if you actually use technology with expert advice. Another uh, homemade video, let's see if that works. I call that, uh, let's see, oh, no. Well, that was supposed to be called size orange, rather Newton's apple. So you would have seen a slow motion video of an orange coming up and down. The reason I put that up is, when you talk about Newton's apple, you think of physics, which Sir will be talking about later. You think about physics, but really the apple is an epitome of biology. The apple is also an epitome of genetics. The apple talks about mathematics with its shape. Likewise, in healthcare, we really need to have an interdisciplinary approach. Doctors cannot be in isolation when they're actually taking care of patients. You really have to think about what else can I use to help patients. And oftentimes, it's not the health guy, it's not the medicine, it's not the surgical tools. It's more about what can I bring together to help a patient like Pushpa. Pushpa is on the outer ring road, 100 kilometers from the nearest hospital. What can I give her to save her life? What if the car that she was in had a first aid kit with a defibrillator? What if there was good cell phone coverage where I could FaceTime with her and tell her, you know what? put the leads on the patient and see if she's in ventricular fibrillation 
and press the button to give electric energy to revive the heart. These are things which are completely doable now. When you can do WhatsApp, we can you know, transfer millions of rupees and dollars with the touch of a phone, why not with healthcare? This is a quick snapshot of what we do at one of our locations, where you can see a picture of a nurse, a doctor in the background. We have a video screen where we are having continuous communication with remotely located intensive care units, which are several hundred to thousands of kilometers away. We're able to talk to the patient. We can see their ventilator. We can actually look at their cardiac rhythm. We have all the data in hand. All we need at the other end is a relatively reasonably educated junior doctor who can carry out our instructions because that's all you really need. And this is not a new concept. Hundreds of years, maybe decades, doctors have been picking up the phone and giving advice. In the middle of the night, the senior doctor is not coming into the hospital. He's telling the junior doctor what to do. But this is way ahead of that where we can see the patient 24 by 7 with trained physicians actually evaluating and taking care of the patient remotely. I have personally resuscitated patients 8,000 miles away. I have instructed nurses to give medicines 8,000 miles away to get somebody back to life. When we can actually effect such change using technology, it really should be much more widespread. This is a quick snapshot of what it looks like when we look at our screen. We look at the cardiac rhythm. We can have blacked out some of the data, but you can actually peer in as good as the iris of the eye and see if there is a reaction or not. I think tele-ICU is here to stay. You require nursing skills. You require education of doctors. You require structured evaluation. You require essentially several components which will help you run a good system in place. And a picture you see in the back is the number of education classes you've been taking for people around the country. So we physically go there and talk to the people in the different hospitals. We are remotely teaching them every day. And we are doing point of care education where we can tell them at 2 in the morning, you know, that's not the way you do it. You do it the other way. And we can actually improve healthcare. And the hope is that the care at the remote sites improves so much that you actually don't require us. My goal is in five years, you don't need us because you have either become so good that you're attracting talent and people want to stay in your remote areas and you actually want the doctors don't want to leave. And there are some elements pointing in that direction, especially in rural areas in the United States where they're seeing that nurses and doctors have significant job satisfaction when they know there is a element of support. Of course, there are challenges. There are mountains to be climbed. There are clouds to be parted apart where nothing works completely as you want it to be. It can be a technological challenge. It can be a bandwidth challenge. But the biggest challenge probably is a challenge of the concept. It would be almost preposterous to think of me saying that I can sit here right now and on my telephone pull up an intensive care unit 10,000 kilometers away and talk to somebody and tell them, you know you need to increase the dose of that medication. But that's the reality. I could actually do that if I wanted to. But there are several barriers to doing that right away because you have regulatory barriers, you have barriers of education, you need to have an established link with an entity. So there are several logistic issues which are actually the bigger challenges to running something like this. That's a a sad slide. I'll tell you why it's sad. We did an analysis of what kind of patients are we seeing. As expected, there was a lot of heart disease, there was a lot of lung disease, and an assortment of other diseases. But almost catching up with heart and lung disease was the number of people trying to kill themselves. Organophosphate poisoning or pesticide poisoning almost caught up with the number of people with heart or lung problems. Critical care is not a health care issue, it's a social issue. This is a social issue. Until we fix the poor farmer out there who doesn't have enough to eat, who is forced to actually think about taking his own life, none of this matters. It doesn't matter if we build buildings of 100 stories high. It doesn't matter if you have airplanes which go four times the speed of sound. Until we can affect that one individual out there who is right now, right now, sitting out there and contemplating, you know, life is not worth it. 
until we can actually make a change there, none of this matters. Some of the challenges, technology is obviously going at jet speed, things are going ahead. Healthcare applications, healthcare procedures are going ahead at the pace of a running man. The one thing that isn't changing fast enough is doctors and healthcare's adoption of these changes. There's an intrinsic inertia, which I call, you know, you can't see it well, but it's like a snail. And some of the speed blocks are doctors themselves. But we are somewhat slow to adapt these things. Sometimes a good measure because you get this new concept that changes overnight and you think it's not right anymore. But sometimes we have to figure out, can we actually effect change by integrating, assimilating, and collaborating with several other people. I think this quotation I like to sometimes say because it's a very inspiring and optimistic quotation for me where we really think the past is history, the future is a mystery, today is a gift and that is why we call it the present. And an opportunity like this for me to share with all of you what I do where I can actually deliver intensive care to people who I'm not able to even touch, who are far away, but I can actually impact their lives this is a great beginning and a great opportunity. And I think one of the reasons we're all here is because you never stop learning, because life never stops teaching. And I showed this slide to my son and he said, but dad, you gotta use what you learn. So exactly, so I think what we really need to figure out is, can we actually make a change and effect change by simple things that we keep our eyes open and help Pushpa. Pushpa could be anywhere. She might be in Dubai, she might be in America, she might be in India. I think until we actually figure out can we make a change where we integrate our knowledge with technology and an intention to serve, we will only then make a difference. Thank you.